Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan, and this is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, slowing growth, fleeing foreign investors, and a property giant ordered to liquidate. China's economy has faced a slew of setbacks, but is it in serious trouble? Also this week, from tech companies to media, American firms have slashed thousands of jobs since the start of the year. Other workers fear they now could be at risk. Plus, so-called polyemployment is on the rise. We'll take a look at why employees are increasingly working more than one job. Now, China was expected to experience a rip-roaring recovery after it lifted strict COVID-19 restrictions, but Almost a year after the measures ended, the Chinese economy seems to be stumbling. Prices have fallen, exports and imports have plummeted, unemployment has risen and the real estate crisis has deepened. The sentiment is so bad that foreign investors fled the stock market last week. The situation could get even worse after the nation's biggest property developer, Evergrande, was ordered to liquidate. Imogen Kimber reports. It's being described as a nail in the coffin for the world's most indebted property developer, Evergrande, and another blow for China's slowing economy. A court in Hong Kong has ruled that the Chinese company must go into liquidation. Our first mission is restructuring business. We will keep the value of Evergrande in order to increase the ability of the creditor and stakeholder to pay the debt. It's been two years since China's largest home builder defaulted on its debt of $300 billion, marking the beginning of China's property market crisis. The company has been working on a restructuring plan, but with no tangible results, Judge Linda Chan has ruled that enough is enough, though China has not always recognized Hong Kong rulings. The problem the liquidator in Hong Kong would have, or any offshore liquidator, is they have no enforcement rights onshore in China. So all they can do is try to attempt to grab assets and sell assets that are offshore, but the majority of the value in this case is onshore in China. Already causing fears and uncertainty is how significant the company crash is to the troubled Chinese economy. And I suspect that the Chinese government will manage this liquidation process very carefully in a way that doesn't uh, cause major problems for the Chinese economy. In other words, it's not a, a Lehman moment like we saw back in 2008. But that's partly because Evergrande was already considered as good as bankrupt and the property crisis is already in full swing. This is just further evidence of uh, a, a large property bubble uh, in China. Uh, and, you know, Evergrande's collapse was in many ways a consequence of that. It was when um, Beijing cut down on lending to property developers in 2020 slash 2021 that Evergrande really got into serious trouble. From the 90s until 2020, property developers could access large bank loans to fund developments. But when the cash flow stopped, Evergrande and other property developers headed for collapse. It's estimated there are millions of people who have paid up front for homes but are yet to move in. And the rest of the economy is suffering too. Last year, China's GDP grew by 5.2%, the slowest in three decades, excluding the COVID-19 years. Consumer spending is down, causing prices to drop and make China one of the few countries threatened with deflation. And foreign investment fell by 8%. Most economists don't think all that will have a knock-on effect worldwide, but others fear the worst is yet to come for the second largest economy in the world. Imogen Kimber, Al Jazeera for counting the cost. Joining us now from Hong Kong is Alicia Garcia Herrero, Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at Matixis Bank. Good to have you with us, Alicia. What's been the fallout then on the Chinese economy of this liquidation order against Evergrande? Well, I think the biggest impact of this liquidation will be on Hong Kong, as well as on Chinese companies issuing debt overseas, mostly in Hong Kong, indeed, in dollar. Why? Because I just don't think that uh, the Chinese courts are going to accept um, the Hong Kong court to seize assets for the offshore creditors. Why? Because it is very likely that they will prefer these unfinished units, which are more than a million only for Evergrande, to be finished with the proceeds of, of Evergrande, with whatever assets they are left. 
So thinking that foreign investors are going to get these assets is very unlikely. And this means that any new investor in China trying to, you know, thinking of buying uh, Chinese bonds uh, in dollar will think twice because basically now it's obvious that they cannot seize the assets, that most of the assets are on the, in the mainland. And that's going to increase the cost of funding in dollar for Chinese companies overseas. We've talked about this on the programme many times before, about, about the property crisis and, and, and where rock bottom is. Have we now finally touched rock bottom? Why hasn't the Chinese government been able to, to pull the sector out of the doldrums? Well, uh, in terms of um, crisis, you know, real estate crisis, financial crisis, we're out of the doldrums because the Chinese economy is highly uh, intervened or in, in state uh, uh, hands, including the banking sector. So it's, it's in a way, and there's capital controls, so the money cannot leave. Uh, this is why we've not seen a full-fledged crisis. By the way, we didn't see it in Japan in the 90s either, because at the end of the day, the, 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 those who are holding China's debt are, are in the mainland. They, they can't run away. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's no consequences from this uh, real estate demise. And this is mostly deflation because the real estate sector is pushing down upstream prices, iron ore, cement, etc. And that is having a toll on the Chinese economy, huge overcapacity. Deflation will be a major problem if it's not, if, if it doesn't get solved. So in that regard, yes, it is, this crisis is costly. All right, most... This demise, maybe not a crisis. Most economic indicators right now are pointing in the wrong direction. Is China's economy in serious trouble? I would actually start by saying that I don't think 2024 is going to be much worse than 2023, so it's really a muddling through situation. It's not a crisis. I explain why. It's just very difficult to have a crisis in China. However, the cracks behind the structural deceleration are not being repaired. Uh, you could repair them with reform, the huge opening up of the uh, Chinese economy, perhaps even fiscal reform, which is desperately needed in my view. All of these things are not happening. So the cracks are getting bigger, but they're not big enough for the building to fall. So we will still see slower growth, maybe slightly slower, but not uh, a recession or, or a crisis in China. Alicia, I'll be back with you in just a second. Chinese leaders have signaled concerns over the economy by taking measures aimed at reviving growth and steadying markets. They include a decision by the central bank to slash the amount of cash that banks are required to hold in reserve, which could provide long-term liquidity to the economy. China's also tightened stock market rules as the government tries to halt a deepening sell-off. Almost $6 trillion dollars has been wiped off the Chinese and Hong Kong stock market since uh, 2021. Alicia, with the lack of any big stimulus package, what do you make of the steps taken so far to revive growth? And, and uh, what does it take to revive a, an economy like China's, which is, which is huge? Yeah, good point. So I actually do agree with cutting uh, reserve requirement ratio, even rates, uh, because... As I said, I worry about deflation in China. So if I were the PBC, I would cut. But the reason why the PBC is not cutting rapidly is that they really worry about outflows. So the interest rate differential with the Fed is very important because there's basically outflows going to the dollar, which is very profitable in terms of return on, the do on dollar assets. And if the PBC cuts now, it's basically instilling more of this exit of capital. Uh, with a weakening RMB, which is a very bad signal for those who are still there with capital. So this is why they're, in a way, it's a catch-22. They need lower rates, but on, at the other, on the other hand, they, they want to keep the capital in China. And this is why China is very keen, more than ever, to receive foreign investment, more than ever. We need to realize that. This is a charm offensive that we all see. Uh, but... So far, it hasn't worked. Alicia, you say that you're worried. Should the rest of us be worried? And investors, as you say, are already spooked. Will they, will they trust ever uh, putting their money into China uh, uh, again? Or is, is China now set for a, um, a, a, an almost a death spiral, a, a loop of low confidence? 
Well, I would, uh, first of all, uh, answer the question in the following way. Uh, do you trust the Japanese economy? Maybe you do. Maybe after 25 years of deflationary pressures, you're ready to go. In fact, everybody's going to Japan now. Why? J Japan is so cheap now. Yeah, the yen is cheaper. They've gone through a very, uh, very big uh, inflation differential with the world until recently, basically much lower inflation in Japan. So Japan is so cheap now compared to what it was in the 80s, early 90s. So this is the, 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 the its GDP is also smaller because, you know, no growth, no, no inflation. Uh, I don't think China will be as severe as Japan because China is a big manufacturing power globally. And it has literally nearly 30% of manufacturing market share. Japan never got there. So I don't think it will be as bad as Japan. But uh, I do think that China's com rapid convergence with the US, with the developed world, will decelerate. That convergence at some point will stall. But the good news is that China, by that time, meaning by the time China grows the same as the US, possibly between 30 and 35, China will have $25,000 per capita. So it'll be a huge market, already is, but even bigger, with, with rather um, rich, so basically uh, escaping the middle income trap, big country, big consumer, consumer lend less than the US. Okay. Chinese consumers will never consume as much as the US because consumer propensity is lower, but a big market. Okay. So it's a mature market. This is the key, mature oh. market, not a growth market. That's where China is heading. Okay. Alicia, really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Thank you. A very different story in the US. The economy there grew faster than expected and stocks hit record highs. The market rally was mainly driven by the tech sector. But despite raking in big profits, tech giants are downsizing. Nearly 100 tech firms have together laid off almost 25,000 employees. That's in just the first month of the year. And it's occurring not only in big companies, but in smaller startups too, across a range of roles. Meta, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, TikTok, and Salesforce are among the companies slashing jobs. The move comes as tech giants are pouring billions of dollars into artificial intelligence. More than 260,000 layoffs were recorded in the industry last year, according to layoffs.fyi data. The job cuts back then were in response to tough economic conditions and changes in consumer habits in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Well, the layoffs aren't limited to the tech sector. Citigroup Bank said last month that it was cutting 10% of its workforce. Several retail companies are cutting jobs in order to lower costs, and many journalists began the new year with a pink slip. Nearly a dozen mainstream organisations, including prominent newspapers, are reducing their staff numbers. Joining us now from London is Carl Benedict Frey, Director of Future of Work at the Oxford Martin School at Oxford University. Good to have you with us, sir. So, as we said, the US economy is booming, stocks are rallying, the tech sector is striving... And yet thousands of workers are being laid off. What's going on? I think what's happening is that we've seen a period where money has been exceedingly cheap. And that is changing now with interest rates rising. And what that means is that after a period where companies have expanded their operations, invested, hired more people, they're now tightening their belt um, and as a consequence, we are seeing these layoffs. And they are also, as you mentioned, uh, heavily impacting smaller companies um, as venture capital firms are becoming more risk averse in the new high interest uh, rate um, environment. And I think that is the sort of the driving force behind these layoffs. OK, you say they're tightening their belts. They're businesses. They exist to make money. Do they really need... To, to get rid of these staff, uh, these people. Uh, and, and is this going to be contagious? Are we going to see it across multiple sectors, not just the tech sector? I think the effect of interest rates on employment are going to be seen across a variety um, of sectors. But remember, the tech sector expanded particularly rapidly uh, in the years uh, leading up uh, to these uh, rising interest rates. So I think the impact is going to be more significant um, in the tech sector. Whether they need to do it or not, 
Um, I'm not a business analyst, but I do think that they are under quite a massive pressure from investors to improve in prof profitability. OK, so it could be in investor-driven. The, the other question I want to ask is that to what extent is AI replacing people? So artificial intelligence is going to have a huge uh, impact on the labour market going forward. But I don't think we've seen much of outright replacement uh, from AI yet. I think what's happening gradually, though, is that artificial intelligence is changing the business model in many companies, in particular firms that have been very reliant on digital adver advertising for revenues, are now seeing those revenues being challenged to a large degree by technologies like ChatGPT. Um, and I think there are big question marks over to what extent people will continue to use search and, and uh, the web uh, to find news and information. And uh, depending on the impact um, on uh, web traffic in particular, um, the uh, impact on companies' advertising revenues um, can, can be quite significant. We, we talked about um, the media sector also uh, laying off jobs. Um, very different reasons, I assume, from the tech sector. I mean, is AI something to do with what's going on in the media industry? Do, do business models need to adapt and change? So the media industry has been under pressure for some time now, uh, to a large degree because of rising competition from other types of platforms and changes in the way that people consume news uh, and uh, entertainment. But I think in addition to that, AI is now creating a perfect storm as it becomes easier for outsiders to generate content with the help of ChatGPT as news organizations can become leaner as a result of generative AI. And obviously, many media companies, re companies rely on advertising, advertising rev uh, revenues very heavily. And as that business model is gradually being undermined by generative AI as well, uh, the layoffs in the media industry have been particularly massive. What does all of this tell us about the US labour market uh, right now, particularly after uh, the, the Fed's uh, latest decision and, and its impact on the economy? So I think that m most of the impact from rising interest rates um, have already uh, been seen. But there are clear question marks over generative AI and its impact on labour markets going forward. And I think we are very much at the cusp of a transformation, which is very similar to the one electricity had on the US economy. And as companies change their business models in response, uh, as AI uh, changes the way corporations work, there will be layoffs going forward, uh, but there will also be new job opportunities emerging. Really good to talk to you, sir, on counting the cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. My pleasure. Now, the practice of working more than one job to make ends meet is nothing new, but the trend now known as poly-employment is no longer driven solely by financial needs. Exploring different career paths is another reason why employees work two full-time jobs simultaneously. And despite the stress involved in double jobbing, not to mention the lack of sleep, polywork is on the rise. A new study by workforce management and scheduling platform Deputy found. Poly-employed shift workers more than doubled over the past two years. 60% of poly workers are women and disproportionately young. The survey found that one in five Generation Z workers engage in poly employment. The vast majority of double jobbing, though, took place in the hospitality sector. Healthcare and retail are others where the trend is common. So why do people take on more than one job and how does that affect their work-life balance? We'll put that question to our guests shortly, but first let's hear what some employees have had to say. Right now in the United States with how expensive everything is, especially for college students, I think people feel like they have no choice. For example, I'm someone that's going to enter in the summer, but I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should get another side hustle, another job, because I'm going to be in New York City and New York City is an expensive place. So I think that people are put in positions where they feel like in order for me to feel secure and safe and comfortable, especially as a woman, you feel like you need to take the extra 10 steps. I've had multiple jobs. I had multiple jobs last year. Uh, this year, I'm a little bit more stable, so I have a regular job now. Uh, I was a, sort of a startup founder, so it, at that point it was like I needed to have multiple income streams because they were so you know, volatile and fluctuating. 
But there were probably some, you know, a few weeks where I averaged more than 100 hours a week. Um, but it also gave me a lot of freedom, and, and so it's, it's kind of like a, uh, there are pros and cons to it. Like you, you get to kind of offset a lot, but then again, at, at the expense of working really, really hard in sort of shorter time frames. Maybe it's being too positive, but I can imagine it being nice to have several different jobs. What I like about my job is there's a lot of variety, so it could be nice not to do the same thing the whole time, to do different things. All right, joining us now from Melbourne in Australia is Dr. Shashi Kurananethi. He's a chief economist at uh, Geographia, a global city planning consultancy. Uh, good to have you with us. Um, poly employment, it's on the rise, though, and it's not just people making ends meet now, is it? That's right. Uh, it's clearly a pattern that has heightened because of cost of living pressure, inflation. But what we found in analysing millions uh, of shift work hours is that this trend is currently being pushed by young Generation Z workers who are looking to experiment in new career paths as a means uh, by taking multiple jobs in multiple industries. So that's a very interesting trend that is recently occurred. The other aspect to that is that younger people, the notion of, of lifelong career paths uh, are sort of thrown out of the window with younger people. Uh, I think the experience of the GFC and, and the pandemic has made young people realize uh, job career paths are not as stable and secure as they thought it was or as they thought their elders had. Uh, and so younger people tend to take on multiple jobs sort of as a, uh, an insurance risk against losing one job while still maintaining another. And that certainly has taken uh, a lot of place in, in this heightened okay. labour uh, insecure market. All right. On, on counting the cost, we, we like to look at the global picture. Is this trend more pronounced in, in certain countries than others? Uh, it's certainly more pronounced in developing countries' contexts. Uh, Part of it is inflation, but also rising cost pressures. You can appreciate uh, a high proportion of young people uh, continue to rent uh, and uh, increasing housing uh, and affordability has driven them uh, in part to take on multiple jobs to make and make and meet. Uh, what we found is the trend is uh, most heightened in places like Australia, where there's peak housing cost pressure. Uh, and there's a 30 year high in the share of workers taking on multiple jobs. Uh, we've seen, we're seeing decadal highs in the US and the UK labour markets as well. Are employers concerned about this, about this trend? The fact that, that somebody might be coming to work for them having already finished a shift elsewhere, I mean, that, that's got to impact, impact productivity, hasn't it? Uh, certainly, but some employers are, are not able to provide uh, more reliable work hours for employees, especially in shift work industries like hospitality, retail and nursing. The notion of uh, reliable work hours is, is, is more planned on a weekly basis. And workers, particularly young workers, who are looking for more secure streams of income, uh, are taking on multiple jobs uh, to, make it, to ma manage those income flows. Uh, certainly, uh, if, if employees were able to plan forward ahead with employees uh, on, on flexibility structures and reliability of work hours, uh, I think they, they would find a way to, to manage uh, those, those workers that are taking on multiple jobs. And, and why is the trend more common among women than men? Sure. So if, if you think about it, the, the gig work economy has been a boon for people uh, with extra work hours. But uh, women, particularly young women with family responsibilities, have to juggle uh, their employers' needs, their families' needs, while ensuring a reliable stream of income and work hours. Uh, the best way to do that uh, is frequently not through taking on uh, gig work, but taking on multiple uh, reliable shift work jobs, uh, two or more jobs uh, sometimes. Fascinating. Doctor, it's been really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Thank you. And that's our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything that you've seen, you can get in touch with us on X. I'm at A. Finnegan there. Please try to remember to use the hashtag AJCTC uh, when you do contact us via X. You could also drop us a line. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our email address. As always, plenty more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page. There you'll find individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. 
But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.